Good morning, Radiant Church. Good to be with you here. Hope you're having a wonderful day at home. 
Uh, we we're going we're to worship the Lord. I want to start off with a call to worship from Psalm 47. And I'd like you at home to do this. Don't just kind of listen and go along. Let's actually engage and do this thing. Clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is awesome, a great king over all the earth. God has gone up with a shout. The Lord, with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises. Let's sing joyful, exuberant praises to the Lord because he is worthy of that. Amen? Let's worship him. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Go, my soul, praise him, for he is thy health and salvation. in what he ordained Praise to the Lord who doth prosper thy work and defend thee Surely his goodness and mercy daily attend thee Ponder anew what the Almighty can do If with His love He be friendly Praise to the Lord, oh, let all that is in me adore Him. All that has life and breath come now, praises before Him. Let the Amen sound from His people again, gladly forever adore Him. Amen, sound from his people again, gladly forever adore him. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. They are many, His mercy is yeah. Sing what love, what love could remember, no wrongs we have to. Omniscient, all knowing, He counts not their sound. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy. 
see his mark. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. than darkness new every morn our sins they are many His mercy is more riches of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood neath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. So much more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness. New every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Yeah. Stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Bow your heads and pray with me. Father God, we thank you that your mercy is more. Lord, thank you that you wash us with your mercy, that no matter how many things we've done, God, your mercy is more. God, it is true, our sins, they are many. Lord, our sins were, were costly for you to pay that debt, but you chose to do that. And so we praise you, Lord. We praise the Lord Almighty because you have called us your friend. We praise you for that and we thank you for that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, Radiant Church. It is so good to be with you guys once again, and I'm excited to bring you some riveting announcements, everybody's favorite part of the service, and so very, very psyched to be able to do that. And thank you so much for joining us online. We are so excited to be able to come to you with um, uh, with these digital resources, either on Facebook or on YouTube. We're so thankful that we're, you're still able to be a part of the church, even if you are at home. And so we appreciate you, and we wanted to thank you. Well, we are going to uh, take our offering together, and um, we're, you can give in a couple different ways. Um, you can mail in a check to 2717 Northeast 3rd Avenue. That's our address there. You can also give online at radiantofcamas.org, radiantofcamas.org, or you can even text to give. You can pull out your phone right now, 
just like this, and you can even text to give. And so you pull up your little text thing, and you can send that. You just send any dollar amount to 360-383-5344. Go ahead and bow your heads, and let's pray together. God, we thank you for this uh, glorious opportunity to worship you. God, thank you for a chance to um, just rejoice through our giving. God, to rejoice through this offering, and we do it as an act of worship to you. In your name, amen. Well, after service uh, today, we are going to be taking communion, and so taking communion here, and so at any point, if you need to uh, take some time to get your elements ready, if you haven't had a chance to do that yet, you can just pause that right there, and you can get those elements ready. Just like that. There you go. And so go ahead and take care of that. And other than that, just be paying attention online, Facebook and YouTube, Instagram, or our website for a new content. We just recently have been working on revamping our website, and we're excited to get out a new welcome brochure and some new content in the um, Who We Are section, the About Us section of our website. And so feel free to go check that out. Uh, those changes have been made online, so you can see those, and we will see you online. Now, without any further ado, I am going to invite up the illustrious the incredible, the unforgettable Jeremy Carmichael, and he is going to deliver the most amazing word that you've ever heard. Well, thank you, Ryan. Well, I don't know if I'm going to be able to deliver the most amazing sermon you ever heard, but I am preaching from the most amazing word you've ever heard, the the Bible. So uh, please stand with me uh, at home and turn with me to John Chapter 2, verse 1 through 11, we are beginning our new series called The Miracles of Jesus, and we begin with this miracle in Cana, John 2, 1 through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of his signs. Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Let's pray together. You may be seated. Lord, we thank you for this time in your word, and I pray that you would illuminate it to us. Holy Spirit, draw us into truth. Help us to see what you are wanting to communicate in these passages. Lord, as this passage says uh, that this sign, this miracle, uh, manifested your glory. Lord, may we see that revelation. May your glory be revealed to us in this time, I pray, by the power of your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, beginnings are important. Whenever something important begins, there is always some sort of declaration uh, that articulates and defines what the nature of that new thing will be. This is true of any time there's something new that's important, something new that matters. For example, when a marriage begins, how does it begin? With sacred promises in the form of vows. When a movement begins, a new movement, whether it's a governmental movement or just a movement of peoples somewhere, it's going to begin with a founding document or maybe even like a manifesto or something like that. Or when a new governmental administration begins, it always begins with an inaugural address that happens in our country when there's a new president, uh, uh, when a new administration begins or a new term of the president begins, it always begins with an inaugural address. And that address is declaring something about what that new administration or what that presidency is going to be all about. This happens 
all over the world. For example, uh, one of my favorite historical examples of this is uh, uh, Winston Churchill. When he uh, began his prime ministership in 1940, he gave a famous speech where he said, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. So when something begins, there's an articulation, there's a declaration about what this new thing is going to be. And here in our passage today, we observe the sign, which is another word for miracle, a miracle that points to something, which inaugurated Jesus' public ministry. Now, this is not simply or merely a record of what happened, but rather this sign reveals the majesty and the glory of who Jesus is and what he came to do, as verse 11 attests to when it says that this sign manifested his glory. So let's take a look and see what is manifested here. See what we can learn about who Jesus is and what he came to do. Three things we'll look at to unpack this. First, we'll look at an an intriguing conversation. Secondly, we'll look at a a revealing miracle. And lastly, we'll look at, uh, ask ask the question of uh, what do we do? Or what, what does this mean? How do we, um, what do we learn based on, or what does this mean for us now? That's the last one. <laughs> the question, what does this mean for us now? So let's start with the first, an intriguing conversation. What is this conversation all about? And it is an intriguing conversation, seeing Jesus interact with his mother in a way that is somewhat curious. What do we learn? Well, this first miracle, this first sign happens within the context of a wedding. Mary, Jesus, and his disciples, we're told, were invited to a wedding. Now, you have likely been to a wedding. You have an idea of what a wedding's all about. There's the ceremony, usually lasts 20 to 30 minutes, and then there's a reception that might last two to three hours. Well, weddings back then were a bigger deal. As big of a deal weddings are right now, they were even a bigger deal back then. They would last three to five days. They would be, uh, you you would see, uh, there would be feasts every day, all kinds of amazing things happening. These people were having a party. There's nothing like it today. There's nothing like, uh, we have nothing today that is similar to this. Again, the closest thing is what we would call a wedding, but can you imagine going to a wedding and all the celebration, all the festivity that's packed into that and it lasting almost a week? That's what they were invited to. And how it worked was this. The bridegroom, or that is the groom, the, the husband, the new husband, he was in charge of footing the bill for this three- to five-day feast, and managing it, making sure that the party-goers had all the food and all the wine that they they, they required to have a good time all the way through. And Mary noticed something. Being Mary, she was always pondering, very observant sort of person. She noticed he's running out of wine well before the party was going to be done well before the wedding feast was going to expire. And so she comes to Jesus. Now, the reason she came to Jesus, the reason she addressed him in this, is because it was a big deal. You might say, well, so what? They ran out of wine. Well, in this culture, uh, a shame and honor culture, this would have uh, not just, it would not just have been a disappointment to the party goers. It would have brought shame. And it would, uh, it would have, brought, it would have uh, indicated that his new Marriage, this new uh, family that was be- beginning, was off to a horrible start. The failure would impact his ability to do business in the community uh, because it would be like, wow, look, he could even manage his own wedding. He let the guests down. It would be a big deal, especially in a shame and honor culture like that. It even would uh, or could open him up to lawsuits from his new in laws. The bride's relatives could sue him for running out of wine. You think you have in-law problems. This guy was in for some serious in-law problems. So Mary, Mary, Mary notices this, and so she talks to Jesus. She tells Jesus this problem with the apparent desire that he fix the problem and save the bridegroom from disgrace. And Jesus responds to her with what 
is at minimum a measured rebuke in verse 4 when he says, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, why would Jesus respond to Mary, pointing out a very real problem that was happening? Why would he respond to her this way? Two things. Again, this whole sign, this whole miracle and the story surrounding it reveals something about who Jesus is and what he came to do. What does it teach us? Uh, what does this response teach us? First, Jesus was beginning his ministry with a declaration that he is free from human advice, human agenda, and human manipulation. Jesus, in everything that he does in his ministry, he always does and only does the Father's will, as John 5.30 and 8.29 attest to. He only does the will of his Father, and he's making that abundantly clear. He's not doing Mary's will. He does his Father's will. And uh, in other places, he even uh, goes to lengths to sort of distance himself and uh, or, or in, he, it does a, he goes to lengths to show that there is no special obligation that he has to his family. In Matthew 12, for example, his family comes, he's teaching somewhere, and his family comes and wants to talk to him, and they say, your mother and your, and your, uh, your brothers and sisters are, are, are here to see you. And he says, who is my mother? Who are my brothers and sisters? It is you, those who do the will of the Father, those who follow after him. So he makes this distance, and so he's accomplishing that here. He is not a leader who leads by how, what the polls tell him to do. He is not a leader who says, what is popular, I'll do that. What resonates with people, I'll do that. He came to do the will of the Father and nothing else. The second thing that this statement indicates is that his mind seems to be on his own wedding and what it will cost him. When you go to a wedding, uh, what do you usually think of? Now you're thinking about the bride and the groom and all the stuff that's going on. But when you go to a wedding, you can't help but think of your own wedding. Or, especially if you have not been married yet or you're not yet married, you're wondering about what your future marriage will, will look like, what your wedding would look like. It's on your mind. Clearly, Jesus has his mind on his wedding and not just the wedding feast, the mar- not just the wedding supper, uh, marriage supper of the lamb, but what it will cost him. The reason we know that it's, his mind is on what it will cost him is because he uses a word in this response to Mary that is very telling, hour. It says, my hour has not yet come. In the book of John, every time Jesus uses the term hour, he's always referring to his death. I have a list here of all the scriptures where he references that, and I encourage you uh, for, uh, later on to take a look at those. He's always referring to to his death on the cross. And what he, what, so why does he bring that up? Here he is saying that all of his ministry is moving towards the cross. It's not that all that he does between this miracle and the cross is irrelevant, but rather everything he does, he does is and in some way anticipates his glorification on the cross. He is heading to the cross. That's what his ministry is all about. Churchill said, I am here for victory, to bring victory to, uh, at all costs, and I'm going to give you blood, toil, sweat, and tears. Jesus is saying, I'm here to die for the sins of the world. And how does Mary respond? Again, this is an intriguing conversation. She responds wonderfully in verse 5. Where she says, do whatever he tells you. What is she saying? You see this shift. You see the first in verse 3 when she comes to him, she comes in a sense like a mother saying, here's a problem, fix it. In this second response, she approaches him like a believer. First, she comes like a mother and she is reproached. Secondly, she comes like a believer and her faith is honored. She doesn't know what he's going to do. But she trusts him and commits the matter fully to Jesus. She gives it all to him. Says, do what he says. How are you approaching Jesus? Are you coming to him like a mother? Jesus, do this. I have needs. Do this. Or are you coming like a believer 
who has faith. You can make great requests, but you trust him and surrender the matter to him. That's the appropriate thing that we ought to do. So that's the intriguing conversation. Now let's get to the miracle, a revealing miracle. What does this miracle reveal? The new covenant, what it reveals is, is that the new covenant that Jesus comes to mediate is better than the old. Read Hebrews 8, and it talks all about this. The theme of this parabolic sign could be the old has gone and the new has come. The old is gone and the new has come. Jesus, in beginning his ministry, is ushering in something new, something that is far better than any of the people at the wedding or anything that you or I could ever possibly imagine. He's not just coming with a new teaching, a new perspective, a new way to live. He is ushering something much more radical and much better than anything we could imagine. Better than the old covenant and far better than the old way of the world. And you go, what I mean by the old way of the world? Seems like different cultures are always coming up with new things. There's nothing new under the sun. It's just the same old, same old in another form over and over and over again, getting the same thing. What Jesus offers is something new. How? Let's look at it. First, let's look at the stone jars. It says that when he turned the water into wine, uh, he directs the servants to uh, these stone jars. And he filled them up with water, and it was these stone jars filled with water that was then turned to wine. These stone water jars... Um, were used, as the scripture attests to, for ceremonial washing. Now, stone did not contract uncleanliness in the way that, like, say, earthenware would. So it was suitable, a suitable container for what the uh, Jewish people would do is that they would, before they go to the temple, they would cleanse themselves with this clean water, ceremonially clean water, and they would be ceremonially clean, and they could go into the temple. Also, before they, why was it at this wedding? Why was it doing here? They probably used it for cleaning the utensils, people washing their hands, that sort of thing. And so this ritual cleansing, he takes what was used for ritual cleansing, uh, symbolic ritual cleansing, because there's no way that the water itself actually cleansed you of your sin and got you ready to go to the temple. No, it was symbolic. But the water did not cleanse us from sin. But Jesus replaces this water with wine. He replaces this symbolic water with wine. And later, when he institutes the Lord's Supper, he does so by taking the cup and saying, What? This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. The blood of of the new covenant. That which cleanses us in the new covenant is not a shadow of what's to come. It's the genuine article. And it is holy and completely sufficient in cleansing us from sin. Like the song says, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What Uh, can make me whole again. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing, uh, the old covenant is not sufficient for doing that. The old tried and true ways of the world of trying to earn your way to heaven, trying to justify your life, uh, right now, if you look at uh, what's going on in our culture, as you see uh, this cancel culture happening all over the place. Now, what's going on there? They're trying to bring something new. They're trying, with, with this cancel culture, it's a way of saying that this is inferior and what we've got is better. You bad, we good in some respect, right? But here's the problem. None of that's sufficient, Some culture a hundred years from now is going to be doing the same thing with us. Yeah? Not so with Jesus. The new thing he brought 
is wholly sufficient. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not any action we could produce, no public policy we, should, we could ever institute, no governmental uh, legislation or new document or anything, no new system could ever cleanse humanity of their sin, only the blood of Jesus. Now, moving off of that and into another part of what this uh, miracle shows us is that not only is the new wine of the covenant more uh, sufficient in cleansing us from sin, it is also superior in bringing us joy. In bringing us joy. Now, what happens here is that the master of the feast, now who's the master of the feast? He would have been, like in a modern wedding, what, uh, you know, maybe like the DJ and the wedding planner or the wedding coordinator, all combined into one. He was sort of a master of ceremonies who was in charge of keeping the party going. Again, this is a three- to five-day deal, so this is an important role. He shows up when this new wine comes in, and he says, hey, usually you, you wait until you, you give the good wine first, and once people have drunk and had a good time, then you bring out the bad stuff because they're not going to notice so much. But here you have brought, you say, the best for last. This is the best wine, primo wine. What does this teach us? Again, Jesus is superior in cleansing our sin and bringing us joy. Jesus does not call us to a life diluted of pleasure. He does not call us to an existence following a loveless routine of of dry rituals of just trying to figure out all the things you all the don'ts, <laughs> following all the don'ts. I'm not going to do this, not going to do this, not going to do this. That's not the Christianity calls us to. Although, certainly, in the pursuit of Jesus, there's a lot of things we ought not do. Amen. But that is not what defines us. What defines our Christianity, what defines our relation with Christ, is the joy that he calls us into. He invites us not into a dry, ritualistic existence. He calls us into a lavish Feast brimming with unquenchable joy. Look at what the prophet Isaiah describes in Isaiah 25. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord will wipe away tears from all the faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. This joy, you see, that Jesus brings is not doled out in meager proportions. It's a lavish feast. The amount of wine produced in this miracle was 150, upwards of 150 gallons. 150 gallons. That's a lot of wine that was just introduced to this party. Jesus calls us to a lavish feast flowing with the new wine of the kingdom. Now, certainly there is sorrow now, amen? There is much to be grieved about now because we are living in the dawn. The light has come, but darkness still holds sway. We're living in the dawn. The light has come. You know that part, have you ever gotten up early and the light comes, but it's still not fully bright out? There's a little bit of, that's where we're living. The kingdom of heaven has come, but the kingdom of darkness still holds sway in our reality. Now that said, the grief that we experience because of the sorrows of this world, because darkness still holds sway, and because sin still has its grip in, uh, and, and impacts and influences our lives, even the lives of believers, that grief, that pain, that sorrow is nothing compared to the good stuff that's coming. This is what Paul says in Romans 8.18 where he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. What is he talking about? He's talking about their sorrow now, but there is a feast that is coming. 
that is going to be flowing with the richest of foods and the best wine. It's not going to be just a celebration that lasts for a moment. It's a forever feast in the glory of the goodness of the kingdom. And that is going to be far more amazing, far more... Uh, 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 talk about overloading your senses and just taking you into a whole other realm. It's going to be so much better than anything we could ever imagine. And when we have our eyes on that, and even if we just have a small smidgen of a, of a sense of what that could be, it carries us through the sorrow. It carries us, it protects us in our grief and in our sorrow. Now, it allows us actually to face our sorrow, to face our grief, to face the difficult things rather than deny that they're actually happening. Just as Jesus' ministry occurred in anticipation of the cross, so does our life in Christ live day by day in anticipation of the wondrous forever feast that is coming. My question is this, are we doing that? Are we living like that's true? If not, something's broken. Something's broken in our Christianity. Something's off if we are not experiencing and reveling in the joy, the festal joy that Jesus calls us to and gives us. So last point I want to look at here is what does this mean for us now? How do we apply this? to our lives. First thing we do, celebrate the riches of his glory now. Taste it. Revel in it. Experience it. Put another way, we have no excuse to be a wallflower. Uh, when I used to go to weddings when I was younger, I always loved dancing. I loved going and just dancing, living it up, until one day I saw a video of me dancing. And now when I go to weddings, I don't like to dance because I'm overly self-conscious of looking like a complete buffoon. And so what I would say to you is, don't be like me. Cut loose and celebrate. Join the festal joy that is ours in Christ. We lose our sight on joy when we become overly self-conscious and fixated on ourselves. But we burst into celebration. This is true of the way the human heart works. We burst into celebration when we become overwhelmed by the beauty and the wonder that is before us. Put another way, I don't care how big of a wallflower you are, you're overwhelmed with enough beauty and enough glory, you're going to start dancing. You're going to start celebrating. You're going to start worshiping and praising. If we are not celebrating, if our Christianity is not marked with celebration and festal joy. We have lost sight of something. What have we lost sight of? We have lost sight of the fact that we are like the bridegroom in this story. Now, what happened with the bridegroom? He had mismanaged things. His ineptitude had, was about to garner him deserved shame in his community. He knew the rules. He knew what he was supposed to do. But whatever happened, he mismanaged it. His ineptitude was going to bring shame on him and his wife and, mess, and, and, and be a problem for his life moving forward from that point on. He was in a difficult situation. And yet, what happened? Jesus intervened in the midst of his ineptitude. And what happened? He got all the credit. He got praise. He got glory. The master of the ceremonies, the uh, master of the feast said, Mr. Bridegroom, I've been to a few weddings in my day, but you are the best. You've done better than anyone I've ever been to. That's us in Christ. That's us because of the gospel. Jesus, in the same way, uh, in the same way for us, the wages of our ineptitude of sin is death, not just a slap on the wrist. But the cup of wrath that you and I deserved was drunk to the dregs by Jesus himself. He thirsted on the cross that you and I may be able to drink and be satisfied in his glory rather than being destroyed by it. Does this move you to jubilation? 
Or is this a boring truth for you? What are some ways we can move into this festal jubilation, this festal celebration? Three things. First, take time each day to pause and take a break from the chaos to look to Holy Scripture and pray and ask that the reality of His grace would become known to you in a fresh and meaningful way. I like in this, uh, and you may say, well, of course, we're supposed to pray, supposed to be in the Word. Yeah, that's where the gold's found. If you, were in a, if you were mining, like back in the day, you had like a pickaxe and you're mining, it's not that every single swing of the axe goes, gold, yahoo, gold, the end of the rainbow, man. It doesn't happen that way. It requires ching, 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 and then you get some. Ching, and all of a sudden, you might, one day you might get a ton, you might get a little, and over time, you're accumulating treasure. You're, the, the treasure that is in the mine is being made known to you bit by bit, more and more. That's what it's like. Spend time. Don't stop digging. Don't give up. If you're going through a dry time, keep on digging. Pray and say, Lord, reveal to me your glory. Go to his word, and I guarantee you a treasure trove will be revealed to you that will erupt in joy. Second thing is get engaged in the experience of corporate worship. Join the dance. Don't be a wallflower. The easiest thing to do, uh, or, or not the easiest thing to do, I guess, but a common thing is that people join in a worship celebration kind of waiting to see what everyone else does. No one wants to be the first one to clap or to start singing out like no one's watching, man. You just kind of, what's everyone else doing? But man, we're here to worship Jesus. We're here to make much of the one who gave, who lived the life that we should have lived and died the death we should have died. He who had no sin became sin for us that we in him might become the righteousness of God. Man, this is mind-blowing. We got something to sing about. We got something to clap about. When we worship together, something happens when we experience a time of heartfelt worship together. We taste the glory instead of simply acknowledging that it, it exists. And the Bible often refers to the kingdom of heaven in sensory uh, language. For example, a feast flowing with wine and rich food. This is one of the reasons why we engage in musical worship. We could just read the truths and nod and go along, but we use music. Why? Because it's a, a unique thing. It's a gift from God. It creates a sensory experience where the Spirit takes you over and floods your imagination, saturating your heart with the reality of heaven. When we engage in music and we're lifting up these holy truths, something happens. So what can you do? Again, join the dance. Do a few things. Show up on time for worship. When we all get, I guarantee, when every time we've had this place packed right at start time, we have a, we have a hoot nanny, man. We have a time of worship. Clap. Get, a, get moving. Get your move on. Start moving around. Get into it. And don't, and don't, um, uh, a good dance party isn't a good dance party because everyone's so skilled at dancing. A good dance party happens because everyone's participating in it. So don't worry how goofy you look when you're dancing or how beautifully you sing. Sing with all your heart. And if we all do that, I guarantee you, we will experience and taste something of the glory of God together, which is unique and beautiful. Focus on the truths that are espoused in the songs and let it catch fire in your heart erupting in praise. Let's do better than the rocks. Remember when Jesus said, if you guys keep silent, even these rocks are going to cry out. Let's beat the rocks every time we gather or every time you're in your home. Amen? Last thing, and, or actually third thing, enjoy gospel community. A solitary feast is a depressing sight. If you created a feast and you're the only one that showed up, that's kind of sad. The transformative power of the gospel, though, opens the doors for something really amazing to be, uh, be possible in our lives. And that's this. We have the resources to have relationships, to foster and create relationships with our brothers and sisters in Christ that are transparent, that are honest, that are intimate, that are loving. We have the ability in Christ to create a community that is rich in humility, rich in boldness, being able to speak truth boldly and unashamedly. 
being able to be a people that are quick to repent, quick to forgive, quick to reconcile. Our world needs that kind of community right now, more than ever, maybe more than ever. Certainly, you couldn't argue that. We don't need it now. Part of the way we experience festal joy is getting together. And it takes work to put on a feast. It requires hospitality. It requires calling some people, doing some organization, getting people together. Do it. Do the hard work to put together some community. Don't wait for someone else to initiate. Be hospitable. Make some friends. Text some people. Call some people. Pray with one another. Have some barbecues. Get together and develop some relationships that are gospel relationships so that you can help add to the joy of others. The gospel gives us resources to do it. The last thing we do is taking the Lord's Supper. Whenever we take the Lord's Supper, you can go and get your elements now. Whenever we take the Lord's Supper, we're doing two things simultaneously. A lot of times we just look backwards. But we also look forwards. We certainly look back to what Jesus did when his body was broken and his blood was spilled. That's part of the thing. But we also look forward to what that bought for us. He's the founder of the feast that is to come. And every time we eat the bread of the Lord's, at the Lord's table, every time we drink the cup at the Lord's table, we not only look back, but we look forward to the wedding feast that is coming, that is promised for those who are in Christ. So now, take the bread and break it, because you did. And take and remember, as it says, <clears throat> take, eat, remember, and believe that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was given for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. And also take the drink and remember and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was shed for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. This blood paid our debt and gives us a seat at the table to enjoy the most amazing forever feast in the glory of God. Take and remember. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you come to cleanse us of our sin, that you came to cleanse us of our sin. You came to pay the debt we couldn't even possibly ever begin to pay. But in addition to that, Lord, in the midst of that, you bring us in, you invite us into a joy, a joy that's real, a joy that's true, a joy that is living, a joy that is intoxicating. And Lord, I pray that your people listening to me today would be invited into that joy, would join in the festal celebration. In the midst of sorrow, in the midst of grief, Lord, help their eyes to be on who you are and what you've done. While the whole world may be crumbling around us, your kingdom stands strong, and that we can count on forever. Lord, help us to be a joyful people. Help us to give that joy away. Help us to shine with hope in the midst of a hopeless time, I pray. And Lord, I pray for anyone listening here this morning who does not know that joy, who does not know your peace, who has not experienced that forgiveness of sin. Lord, I pray that they would receive you as Savior and choose to follow you all the days of their life. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I send you out, of wherever you're going next, go with this blessing. May the love of God enfold us, May the grace of God uphold us. May the power of God set us free to love and serve all God's people. Now to God, who by the means of the power working in us is able to do so much more than we could ask or even think, to God be the glory in the church 
and in Christ Jesus for all times, forever and ever. Amen? Blessings on you.